cute this bow tie is. It's the first time I've managed to ever tie one. I just I love it. It's so cute. Hi everybody, my name is Sarah Devlin and welcome to this episode of the Pride Month Marathon. Um, you might notice we're um, in a slightly different setting than normal. We are in a different corner of the little alcove that I normally film in. I turned this way so we could have a little bit better lighting. So yeah, let's get started. Um, today we are doing another book review. Um, this one is our first independently published book. It is our first adult book. And it is our first book that I read on Kindle, which really isn't a big deal, but I think it might only be available on Kindle. I'm not sure. I feel like at least at one point it was available in hard, hard, not hardcover, but like, you know, like physical, like paperback copy. Um, but I'm not sure and I will link down below to let you know if you're interested. So this book is Solve for I, and this is what the cover looks like. Um, yeah. Solve for I by A.E. Dooland. So as I said, Soul for I was written by A.E. Dooland, um, and it was published in 2017, I believe. It is an adult romance book. Um, I, as you might be wondering, Soul for I, it's lowercase I. I don't know why this means lowercase, I guess that's smaller. But um, Soul for I, the I, I is a mathematical concept. Um, it is the square root of negative one, which is technically impossible because you can't multiply a number by itself and get a negative number. Um, so it is an imaginary number. And that is actually one of the reasons I dislike math. <laughs> I just, I don't know, it irritates me that there can be something that's not possible, but then just have it anyways. I, anyways, that's a total tangent. Anyways, this book is about a woman named Gemma Rowe, who is in her mid-twenties, and she has suddenly realized that despite being a mathematically inclined person, she cannot solve the question of her sexuality. She thought she was straight and now she's realizing that she's not. And unfortunately she's realizing she's not because she has a huge crush on her pregnant, married, straight best friend Sarah. It's always a Sarah. <laughs> Seriously though, it's always a Sarah. Sarah is determined to help Gemma. Pardon you bird. Sarah is determined to help Gemma find someone um, to be with in her life because she's really happy with her husband and she just wants Gemma to have that same happiness. Although Gemma has not told Sarah she is not straight because she doesn't want Sarah to figure out that she has a crush on her, which she feels if she reveals her sexual identity will be immediately obvious, which I, I can understand as a fear. It seems like the type of fear that would be pretty common amongst uh, people who are hiding their sexualities because I feel like a lot of people will realize their sexuality is not what they thought it was because of a friend and oftentimes that friend is in a position where they wouldn't be able to reciprocate those feelings so you know I feel like that's a common thread it wasn't necessarily my narrative but I feel like that's a common thing from what I've heard. So Sarah has her get tinder, um, get Gemma get tinder and so she's, you know, looking at men on Tinder, swiping left and right. I don't know much about Tinder, but apparently this is how you swipe left and right on Tinder. <laughs> um, looking at men while Sarah's around, but then when she's on her own, she's, you know, looking at women, and she's too scared to engage when she is, um, you know, matching with people beyond maybe just a short conversation. And at Sarah's behest, she matches with a man, and she agrees to go on a date with him and she doesn't use her real name on tinder and it turns out that or she maybe she uses her real name but her face isn't in the picture and it turns out the man who she goes on the date with didn't use his real name and didn't post his picture of his face so when she gets to the restaurant she finds out it is the head of hr for the company that she and sarah work at and to make matters worth worse there is a big union disagreement going on right now. There's like a, you know, possibility of a strike. And so people, when they find out, when she's seen on this date with the head of HR, they start wondering, you know, is she going to have special treatment? You know, do the rules not apply to her? You know, it's all very not professional. So Gemma is both trying to figure out how to solve this problem because she's not attracted to him. She's just, you know, she's attracted to women. She's realizing more and more but she can't, doesn't, isn't ready to tell anybody that. 
but it would be the perfect way to dispel rumors that she is romantically involved with the man that she was seen with on the date. So then this super sexy, intimidating lawyer lady that's helping the employees with their case, with their strike, hatches a plan to help Sarah, or to help Gemma, excuse me, set the record straight that she isn't. Um, and that goes from there. Um, if you like, like, secondhand embarrassment and cringe and angst and all that sort of thing, this would be a book for you. Um, it drives me kind of crazy, but it does have a happy ending the book, so I would say it's definitely worth it. Um, there are some more explicit um, romantic erotic scenes in this book. It's definitely an adult book, not so much a young adult book. I mean, there can be sex in young adult books, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's more of an adult sort of thing, that, you know? So if you're uncomfortable with that sort of thing, this might be something you want to avoid, although it really doesn't add to the narrative so much. Like, I would definitely say that you could read the book, come up to that part, which is towards the end, go, okay, this is clearly where this is going to happen. I'm going to skip, you know, to the next chapter, and you would be fine. So that's something you would have to think about yourself. So yeah, that is the basic plot of Solve for I, and I really, really enjoyed it, and I really think it's a good book. I think that Salt for Eye is an important book to consider when looking at queer literature because Gemma's support network is very understanding and accepting. Um, they're very diverse, um, gender and sexual orientation wise, and it, that's not what holds her back. You know, it's not one of those books where, oh my gosh, everybody's going to hate me, I'm going to be kicked out of my house, which those books have their place, but I feel like even if it's not true for everybody at this point where everybody in their lives would be accepting, it's nice to fantasize about, I guess is a, ni a nice way to put it. It's nice to imagine the day when that will be the way it is. And also I feel like it's important because traditionally published works, I feel like, get the most hype, the most review, the most, you know, attention. But being traditionally published does not mean that it's an automatic indicator of good representation of quality writing of a, you know, a story that a lot of people will enjoy. So I think it's important to lift up independently published books because if they're good, they deserve to be read. So that is another reason I think this book's important. And this is definitely a very good book that is independently published, and that is not a slight against it. It is, you know, it is a good book, and it should be read. So that's why I think it's important to point out that there is a lot of independently written queer literature out there, and it is often a lot more explicitly queer than what you will find in traditionally published um, literature and books and whatnot, just because there's less red tape. Not to say that we, that we don't have any explicitly queer books. We do have a lot more now than we have before, but I feel like it's important to remember that body of work. Also, one other thing is that everybody gets a happy ending at the end of this book, and it's not in a cheesy way, but it's really nice that there's no continuation of the, like, bury your gaze trope of the idea that um, same-sex couples have to be miserable, that their relationships can never work out, that sort of thing. It's nice to not have that reinforced, as always. So yeah, that is what I think of Solve for I by A.E. Dooland. I would definitely recommend it, and I hope you enjoyed this review and my little bow tie. I'm so happy with it. I did have to safety pin this. I should probably do the one over here too to keep it from sticking out, but it took me forever to figure out, and I need to either make or buy some more. Um, I'll probably make some. I have some really cool fabric stashed away. So that is it for today. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and I will see you in a couple days. Bye!